Well, guys, it is so great to have you in church this morning. Maybe you're online. It's great to have you joining us. You guys can grab your seats. And um, if you haven't met you yet, my name is Pastor Ruth. I am the Generations Pastor here at Bright Church. And it is my absolute privilege to be able to share with you this morning. Um, Pastor Ben and Pastor Sarah, you'll notice, are not here. Um, They are on holidays having a well-deserved break Um, They're a little bit crazy because they've taken holidays and then decide to move house and that's not much of a break for anyone. So I think at the moment they're having a holiday from their holidays and that's kind of where they're at. So um, we hope that they are having a great time but I get to share with you this morning and um, there is something that I don't know if I really want to tell you about myself. It's a bit of a confession but um, I I feel like, you know, I I should let you know we can get to know each other a little bit. there is something that I love to do at Christmas time, and it might feel like Christmas was a while ago. Um, it was actually just a couple of weeks ago, guys. Time flies. But at Christmas, there is something that I love to do, and that is to watch cheesy Netflix Christmas movies. I love a good... Anyone else in here love a good cheese? I know you have... Yeah, I've come forward, so please support me in this. I love a good cheesy Netflix Christmas movie. Now, there are a couple of criteria that I've noticed watching... Not many, just just a few, not too many, just just a few um, of these Christmas movies. There's a few common um, criteria. Though they need to tick the box for to be a cheesy Netflix Christmas movie, I need A, B, C, okay? Now, one of those things is mistletoe. (laughs) There is always mention of mistletoe and somehow the main characters, they end up at some point in this awkward moment or a romantic moment under the mistletoe. So mistletoe is one of them. There's usually some kind of snowstorm. Okay, it might be a snowstorm that's either meant they have to spend more time together or it's a snowstorm that means, oh no, I can't get home for Christmas. Okay, some kind of snowstorm. The, one of the main characters is usually a farmer or they're royalty or they're a really overworked business person of some sort, someone who hasn't taken a holiday in years and they're finally coming home for Christmas. There's typically um, some matching PJs or ugly ugly Christmas jumper type of uh, reference in there. Um, But the other thing that I have noticed that is in almost all of these movies is this theme of the main character wanting to feel understood, wanting to feel truly known by their love interest. It's like they find this person that finally understands them. And, you know, it's such a fail-safe plot. Why? Because everyone has a desire to belong. Everyone has this desire to feel known, to feel seen. And so everyone can relate to this in some way. You know, people have a desire to be known, to feel understood. And the psalm that we're reading today, um, assumedly written by David, we believe it's written by David, it's a psalm that speaks to being known, to being seen. So we're going to read Psalm 139. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you for night is as bright as the day for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. No one will ever know you as well as God does. He has the most comprehensive knowledge of you, the way you were made, what you do, what you've done, what you'll do. 
God could write a book on you better than you could. No one will ever know you better than God does. And it actually doesn't matter today if you know him, if you believe in God or not. If you don't, if you don't know God, that, that statement still stands. He still knows you better than anyone else does. If you've ever wondered to yourself, does God really even care about me? Does God actually care about me? This psalm should answer that question with an overwhelming yes. He absolutely cares about you. He sees you. He knows you. But as you guys would know, you know, different people have different experiences. They have different upbringings. They have different knowledge of, of who God is and different understanding of who God is. And depending on that, when they hear the name God, their connotations will be different. So some people would see God to be a really distant God. There's a school of thought called deism and what it, what it is is they essentially see that the, the world, that it was created by God, but then God more or less abandoned it to its own devices. He's a distant God. So there would be some people that would believe that. There would also be others that would believe that God is a really authoritative God. He's a God that is just a rule master looking for rule followers. And that's who God is. But we as Christians, that's not the God that we believe in. That's not the God that we read about in the Bible. In fact, we believe in a really relational God, a God who is closer to us than we can ever comprehend. And the psalmist that, you know, we believe to be David, the way that he writes is that he believes in that God too, a God who is close. You know, he uses language like I and you. It's not a distant relationship that this person has with God. It's a close relationship. It's a, it's a loving relationship that he has. You know, you might find that in life you feel misunderstood by people. Maybe you're worried about being misunderstood, having your intentions misunderstood by other people. But you never need to worry about being misunderstood by God. Isn't that kind of freeing? Like you never have to worry about being misunderstood by God. We use big words like omniscient right? It means all-knowing or omnipresent. It means all-present to describe God. He's all-powerful. He's all-present. He's all-knowing. He's, all he's everywhere. And we use these, these, these words and it's so obvious in this psalm that that's who God is. He is. He's all-present. He's all-knowing. He's these things. And he's this big God. And sometimes we can have this tension a little bit in our minds between reconciling this big God, this God who is all-seeing, all-knowing, and then at the same time trying to understand that God also is in the small things. He's a personal God. He's a relational God who's deep for us, runs, his love for us runs so deep. It can be hard sometimes to be like, well, he's this big God, he's all-powerful, but yet he's gentle and loving. And it can be hard to reconcile those things at times, but I think that in this psalm, he does it so well. You see, even when you are not aware of God, he is aware of you. Always. Even when we're not aware of God, what he's doing, when we're not aware of him in the room, he is aware of you. Always there. Your response to God's all-knowing nature can be to either run to him or away from him. It can kind of cause a bit of a response in us. In verse 8 to 10, we'll read it again. It says, If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. When we first start reading this in, in verse 8, it almost seems like David here is like, where can I possibly go where I could escape God? Like, I, I'm, he knows me, I need to escape, right? Like it could be read that way. When we think about God's all-knowing nature, like when you had your worst day, that thing that, you know, you did, God was there in the room with you. When we know that God is always there, he's always watching, it can provoke a response in us, kind of one of two things. One, it could actually make you feel a bit trapped, a little bit like, there's pressure 
pressure on you to reach a certain standard, to, to fall in line. It could make you feel a little bit threatened even. So that could be one response you could have to his all-knowing nature. The other response that you could have is actually to feel really loved by that, really comforted that even on your worst day he loved you, to feel really seen by that, to feel empowered by that. And, you know, I see this all the time working with children. There, there are some kids in particular who, when they're given positive praise, when they're given, you know, wow, you did such a great job on that work, you know, your work, when they're, when they're given that, they actually then get anxious over that because they're like, well, now I need to meet that standard all the time. And what happens is they build up this pressure of this perceived expectation of them because someone congratulated them. And then that can actually lead to them having, uh, well, some kind of behaviour that is not desired by the people around them, right? And in that moment, they can be so misunderstood because really they're just wanting to do the right thing and they get so anxious around that that it ends up presenting in a way that's actually not desired by the people around them. It's some kind of outburst, some kind of meltdown at times. And we, we see this in kids but we also see this in adults because sometimes we put this pressure on ourselves about perceived expectations of meeting a certain standard that we put on ourselves that we get this pressure built up. And what happens with pressure? I want you to picture, a, you know, like a, a pot on the stove. You've got water in there and it starts to boil. As the pressure builds up, what happens to the lid? It starts to rattle, doesn't it? Sometimes it even flips off, right? Because if you don't manage that pressure, it results in some kind of outburst. And that might be running away from God. That might be saying, no, God, actually, I'm going to do my own thing right now. <laughs> that might be, you know, it might be making different mistakes in your life because of that pressure inside you. If we don't manage the pressure, it can lead to some kind of outburst. You see, if you perceive as pressure in your life, if you perceive God's involvement as pressure in your life, the chances are you're probably going to try to feel this need to escape. And I love that where we're in verse 8 to 10, it's talking about even, you know, if I ascend to heaven, that's the highest place God is there. If I, you know, the depths of Sheol, like that's the deepest place. It talks about the sea. That's the furthest point that you can navigate to. So it's saying that if you go, no matter where you go, up, down, all around, there is no place that you can go to escape the presence of God. He is literally everywhere. You can't go far enough in any direction to escape the presence of God. And so if that feels like pressure to you, the chances are you're probably going to try to outrun God in some way, to, to run in the other direction from him. Now, we read about a man named Jonah in the Old Testament. And Jonah tried to outrun God. And given Jonah's example, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, Jonah was a man who was, if you remember, he was um, asked by God to go to Nineveh. He was a prophet. And God wanted to use him in a place called Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go. So Jonah said, actually, God, no. And he decided... I've got an idea, I'm going to get on a boat and go in the other direction. Well, it actually says in the Bible that he tried to flee the presence of God. Jonah obviously didn't realise that the presence of God was everywhere and it was impossible to flee the presence of God. So he's on a boat and a storm starts to rage and the people on the boat figure someone's God must be angry with them. They were right. They work out that it was Jonah and Jonah actually volunteers to be thrown off the boat. He ends, up being, uh, he ends up essentially being transported by a whale. Now, I can think of some other forms of transport that I would prefer other than being in a whale, but Jonah ends up going to Nineveh. Have you ever thought about the fact that it would have been easier for Jonah if he just went to Nineveh in the first place? <laughs> right? You can't escape the presence of God. The thing about Jonah is that he didn't have a kingdom mindset. You see, if Jonah was about what God wanted to do and how God wanted to work through him, then he would have just gone to Nineveh in the first place. But Jonah was trying to meet his own needs, his own wants, his own desires in that moment. And he was trying to live a life outside of the one that God had for him. And so Jonah would have then perceived it as pressure because he was thinking about himself. But if Jonah was kingdom focused, he would have found comfort in the fact that God's presence was with him. He didn't want to go to Nineveh, but when he went to Nineveh, God was with him and he would have been able to find comfort in that in God leading him and holding him and working through him. It's important that we remember this. 
you will perceive God's love as pressure if you're still holding on to the reins of your own life rather than giving them over to him. Thing is, sometimes we don't even realise that we feel pressure. <laughs> like, things can be stirring inside us. We might not be seeing eye to eye with God. Maybe we're, maybe we're spending, you know, not spending much time with him and, and we feel weird coming to God and we haven't even stopped for long enough to realise that something in our heart isn't quite right. It's actually, actually important sometimes to be like, how am I with God? Do I, am I feeling that pressure? And, and if you are feeling that pressure to ask yourself, have I actually given the reins of my life over to God or am I still holding on to those for myself? The truth is you are known by God. You are chosen by God. He has intention on your life. He made you intentionally. We hear that all the time. But just stop for a moment and think about that. Every person in this room was made intentionally. The gifts that you have, your personality, the way you're made up, it was intentional for a purpose to be used by God. And that, the fact that God loves us, made us purposefully and that God is with us should fill us with incredible hope and excitement. In verse 14, and you know, I think we, we use this verse all the time. Verse 14, it says, I praise you, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, the amount of bookmarks, things, you know, Kurong merchandise that has you are fearfully and wonderfully made, right? The amount of prayers, God, we are fearfully and wonderfully made that I've heard. We use this scripture all the time. But has anyone ever stopped to think about the choice of the word fearfully? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Awesome. Fearfully? Like, do we have big scary teeth? Like, are people meant to be afraid of us? Like, I'm fearfully made. It's an interesting choice of word, right? But we know that when, it, when we look at the a healthy fear of God, it's actually recognising the, the bigness and the greatness of God and we're in awe and reverence of, of how great God is, right? Having a fear of God is being in awe and reverence of him. And so when we are fearfully made, it's not that we have big scary teeth, but actually it's a bit of a miracle the way that we are made. Yeah. Like the way that children have formed creation, it's mind-blowing, yeah. right? It's a miracle. It, we, are in, we should be in awe of, of who you are, of the way that you've been made, of, of God's intricate design in you. The fact that every person is different, that's incredible, Right? We are fearfully and wonderfully made and being fearfully made, that awe, we're awesomely made. It brings glory back to God. You know, God is not distant. He made you so intentionally. That doesn't speak to me of a distant God, but a God who is made for relationship, who has made you for relationship with him. I love that in the psalm it kind of goes through this like, even there you're, you're with me and even there you're with me and it really is like very extensive. And then he keeps going. He's like, even in the darkness, you're with me. Even the darkness is not dark to you. He really stresses that there is nowhere we can be that is outside of God's presence. And maybe right now, maybe you're in a dark place. Maybe your mental health isn't great. Maybe no one around you even knows. Maybe physically you might have some stuff going on or things might be happening in your family or with a friend. I, I don't know. Maybe you feel in a bit of a dark place right now. I know that when we're in dark places, it can often be really hard to see hope and really hard to see that light. And it can be easy to think in our own human rationale that God can't reach me there. Or maybe, maybe you've just, there's been so much that happens, that's happened in your life. Maybe you feel like you're a bad person. You're like, God can't reach me. That's great for you. It's great for the Christians, sure, but that's not me and God can't reach me. But I want to encourage you today that God is not intimidated by your sin. He's not intimidated by your thoughts. God is not intimidated by the dark because he is light. There is no darkness with God. God pursues you out of love and never judgment. He pursues you out of love and never judgment. No one will ever love you more than God does. Now, there's a very dark place that we've all been that you may, well, I hope you don't remember. I certainly don't. And that's the womb. <laughs> okay. It talks about the womb. Why does it talk about the womb? Well, physically, that's a really dark place. And none of us, hopefully, remember it. But God does. 
God remembers it. He remembers being there with you. Before your parents even knew that you would exist, he, God knew. Before they even knew that you were starting to be created, before a mother knows that the baby is being created in their womb and they know that they're pregnant, God already knows. He's there intricately weaving together, intricately creating this child, this person. God was with you then. Even before then, he knew that you would exist. Isn't that incredible that God is so intentional in that? It doesn't speak of a distant God, but a God who loves you and wants to have relationship with you. There is no place too dark that God cannot reach you in. And you're not created by accident either. You're not here because two people decided that they wanted to have a child. You're not here because maybe those two people didn't decide they wanted to have, wanted to have a child and, oops, here you are. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. God knew he created you intentionally. He knew you would exist. And even then, he was intricately weaving together who you are now in those moments. God's hand is on you and it's not on you to restrict you. It's on you to guide you. It's a hand of reassurance. He acts out of love. Doesn't Psalm 23 verse 6 say, Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It's his goodness, it's his mercy that follows us, that guides us, that leads us every day of our lives. The truth of the reality of the all-knowing, the all-seeing, the all-powerful God that he wants to be involved in your life offers us a hope and a peace cannot be found anywhere else but God is awaiting your invitation I don't know if you've had those days where maybe something's gone wrong maybe it's stressful maybe it's busy and you're just trying to do everything in your own strength right now I say I don't know if you've had those days I can pretty much guarantee you've had those days and if you say you haven't well then I'm going to call you a liar (laughs) because we've all had those days Right, those days where we're trying to do it all ourselves and we're just not feeling great. And then we have a moment and we go, oh, that's right, God. And we're like, you know what, Jesus, would you just come help me right now? Would you just give me some peace right now? And what happens? God is so ready to meet us where we're at to bring peace, even if the situation doesn't change. He's so ready to bring peace and to help us through those situations and to be with us. How many decisions do we make, days do we live without acknowledging God's presence and inviting him in to the narrative of our story? Forgetting that we're not meant to be writing our story, we're actually writing his story, right? We're we're, we're part of his story. So often we get tied up trying to write our own story, forgetting that actually we're meant to live as part of his bigger story. There is something so much bigger than ourselves and our own life and what we and and what we might feel like we want in that moment we need to remember that we are part of God's story and to invite him in each and every day I don't know if you've ever been in um, a meeting or maybe it was a uni lecture or if you can remember back to school maybe some of you might be in school and it's kind of you know it's time to ask some questions and Someone asks a question, it's a good question, you discuss it as a group, you talk about it and then someone else has a question and they ask the question and then it's, it's the same thing you've just been talking about. You know, I feel like this happens in meetings all the time, especially when it's getting to the end of the day, people are getting tired and someone starts to think, what about this? And it's like, were you here for the last 20 minutes? <laughs> I said, we've, d- we've just covered that. Where were you? Because you were in the room, but were you actually in the room, Right? Life is happening all around them, but they're just not quite aware. I had one of these moments even just between, b- between the services. I was um, standing talking to some people and um, the person we were talking about, they're doing wedding planning and they were standing right there and we said, yeah, I'm so excited that they're getting married soon. It's really great, da, da, da. And we were looking at them, waiting for them to realise they're on their phone. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, oh, hey, we've just been talking about them for about a minute I said that was one of those moments where life was happening all around them, but they just weren't quite aware of what was actually going on. You know, we do this with God all the time. He's always moving. He's always wanting to meet with us. He's always there in the room. 
but we're just so unaware of what he's doing because we've essentially fallen asleep to what's happening around us. It's when we invite God in that we become aware of how he's already moving in our lives. It's when we invite him in that we can hear him clearly. It's when we invite him in that we can be guided by him. It's when we invite him in that we're able to live as he's called us to. And there is no greater satisfaction than being in the relationship you were created for, which is a relationship with God. And there's no greater satisfaction than living out the life that you were actually intended to live, which is the life that God has for you. In Psalm 139 that we've just read, we're going to read verse 23 and 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David has given God an invitation in this moment. God already has searched him. God already knows. But when David actually invites him in, he can become aware of what's happening. Search me, O God, and know my heart. You know, the reason that, that David is saying this is just because is because just before this moment, the psalm kind of takes this weird turn. And we didn't read it, but but David starts saying, like, oh, the wicked, I hate the wicked. And and it's like this really nice, poetic, God, you love me, you see me psalm and then all of a sudden it just takes this turn and it's like the wicked kill I hate the wicked and then it goes oh search me and it start, and it ends beautifully right the reason that he says that that he says oh search me is because he's saying god I don't I don't want to be like that we're so often unaware of our own faults of the own things going on in our own heart that we actually need to ask god to come and search our hearts to see if there is anything that is not of him that is in there. And, you know, we've got to recognise that David as well, he lived before Jesus died for us. He didn't have this full understanding of the grace of Jesus that would come, right? So he's like, you know, curse the wicked, hate the wicked. Well, we live now knowing, well, you know, hate the sin, not the sinner, right? Love, love the person regardless of what's happening. But but David, he's saying, you know, search me, O oh God. If there is anything in me that is not of you, God, I want to know about it. Get rid of it. It takes, it comes from a position of humility to invite God in. To invite God in, we need to have humility. So why not invite God in? Well, maybe we're a bit prideful. Maybe we're not in a position where we're willing to be humble and ask him to search our hearts. Maybe we're scared of what he'll find. Maybe we're scared of having to change our lives, the inconvenience of the sacrifice that that might, that that might bring, of actually being like, okay, God, handing the reins over to you. It's pretty inconvenient. You I mean, you might need to change a few things. Maybe you're scared of what that might look like. Maybe you're worried that you're not perfect and you feel like you're too far for God, you're too far gone. Maybe you're like, no, you say that, but you don't see the things that I've done. You don't know the life that I've lived. Well, God does and he still loves you in that. So why not invite God in? Remember, there is nowhere that is too dark. There's nowhere that God cannot reach you. See, God is a God that, yes, he challenges us, he convicts you, he calls us to change things in our life, but he doesn't condemn us. What I mean by that is the enemy is the one that condemns. He causes you to feel guilt and shame over things that may have happened or things you may have done. God, he just loves you through it. And yes, he wants to challenge you. And some of those things may need to change over time, but from a place of being loved by God, not a place of feeling fear, guilt or shame. If you feel fear, guilt or shame, well, know that that's the enemy talking and not God and that God actually wants to love you and help you through it. It's so safe coming to God because he already knows. It's like the child who, who eats chocolates all over their face and it like, wasn't me, <laughs> or writes their name on the wall and they're like, no, I did not write on the wall. That was not me, right? We, we already know what they've done, but we don't love them any less. God doesn't love you any less. If you are here today and maybe you recognise that actually you do feel a sense of pressure from, you know, from knowing that God is all-knowing, 
He's all seeing, he's all powerful, knowing that. If that feels a sense of pressure, maybe you can identify that actually at the moment, you know that God has put something on your life, but you're not willing to step into it and you almost feel like you're pushing against that and and running in another direction from him. I would really encourage you to just spend some time sitting down and just looking at the character of God. In your Bible, researching, just look at the character of God. Pray for a revelation of God's love for you and his character because it is so safe when we come to God. So it's the new year. It's a good time to reflect. You know, where did you leave God out last year? Where did you forget to invite him into? In 2023, let's intentionally remember to invite God in. Invite him into your circumstances. Invite him into your choices, your decisions, your relationships, your workplace, your school, your university. Wherever it might be where you are, whatever decisions you might be making, invite him in you see the enemy wins when we compartmentalize our faith you know it's great that you're here today and I'm so glad that you're with us at in in church on a Sunday that's awesome but if we leave our faith there we've compartmentalized God in our life there are so many other areas to our lives and when we just allow God to work in one space we become spiritually unaware and asleep to all the other areas in our life God is moving, God wants to work, but we just don't see it because we're not awake to what he's wanting to do. We're not inviting him in to those spaces. When we invite him in, what happens is instead of God just being in this one part, he starts to become the center of everything and we can actually live out of that place and become aware of how he wants to move in the areas around us. This psalmist daily wakes up with the realization that every every morning wakes up with the realization that they are loved and we get to do that too we get to do that too we get to wake up daily with the realization that we are loved so much so that God sent his one and only son Jesus to die on a cross for our sin now why is that important well sin actually separates us from God and so we know that we have all fallen short of the glory of God we have all sinned you me None of us are perfect and we weren't able to live a perfect life. So Jesus, he came and he lived that perfect life in our place. And then he's the one that went to the cross and paid that price for the sin that's in our life. For the sins of the people prior to that, for the sins of those to come, for the sins we've committed, for the ones that we haven't committed yet. Jesus died for that. He dealt with that on that cross and he was raised again, meaning that he defeated the power of that. So that... That is good news because that means that we can have a relationship with God. And it doesn't diminish the, the, the importance of sin. You know, we don't go out to sin because, well, Jesus died, right? Sin is still a big deal, but it means that we know that God loves us and we can have a relationship through it. And that is so powerful. See, no one will ever know you better than God does. No one will ever love you more than God does. And no one will ever care for you as much as God does. You can wake up every day knowing that. Knowing that you are loved, that you are seen, that you are understood, that you're cared for. And every day you can choose to run toward him by inviting him in to the different spaces in your life. So I'm going to everyone to stand. And I'd love to take a moment just to pray together. There's a couple of groups of people that I want to include in this prayer. You might be here today and you might recognise that actually there is stuff that God has put on your life and you just haven't been willing to step into it. Maybe you're worried about what that might mean, the changes that might mean, and maybe you're perceiving a bit of pressure and pushing away from God. Or maybe you're here today and you're like, actually, I really intentionally want to invite God into my 2023. And that's me. I'm putting my hand up for that. You know, this year I want to actually remember to invite God in because in reflection I realised that I actually didn't do that every day. And I want to invite him into all the different spaces in my life in this year. And so my hand's up for that. But with every eye closed, if that's you today, either you, you want to acknowledge, God, I've been running away from you, I want to run to you. Or you're saying, God, I'm going to invite you in really intentionally this year. 
I want to invite you in. Why don't you just raise your hand just as a sign between you and God, just to actually acknowledge, physically acknowledge, like, God, I, like this is me. I'm, I'm stepping into this and I'm going to pray for us. God, I thank you. And right now I just pray for those people who maybe they have been running from you. God, I pray that you would just come and fill them with your love right now. God, I thank you that you're not a God that holds grudges or resents us, God, in any way. But God, you're just ready to meet us where we're at, to love us and to, and, and to work, do a work in our heart. And God, I pray right now that you would come and do a work in their hearts. God, would you fill them with a hope? Would you fill them with passion? God, would you fill them with desire to run after you? God, and I pray for everyone right now who says, I'm inviting you in this year, God. I'm inviting you in to all the spaces in my life. I don't want to compartmentalize my faith, but I actually want to remember to be aware of the way that you're moving. God, I just pray that you would prompt us, that we would remember to do that. God, that we wouldn't become asleep to, to what you're doing, but God, that we would see how you're moving. God, we thank you that you see us, you know us each and every day. God, you know when we sit, when we stand, as the psalm says. And God, I pray that we'd be so aware of your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So one more group of people that I would love to pray for, and that's anyone who has never made that decision to follow Jesus. You see, Jesus, he puts out an invitation to us, and it's the invitation for freedom. It's the invitation for all of our sins to be forgiven, to follow him, to believe in him. You see, when we go to heaven, God doesn't see all the things that we've done, but he sees the perfect life of Jesus. And we don't have to do anything to earn that. We don't have to do anything to earn God's love and favor. That's a gift. And the invitation is there for us to say yes and to respond to that. So I want to give people the opportunity to say yes to that right now. So with every eye closed, maybe you've never made that decision. Maybe you've walked away from God and you want to make that decision afresh today. With every eye closed, if that's you, why don't you just raise your hand just so that I know who we're praying for and then we can pray together as a church. Why don't you repeat after me? Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you've forgiven all my sins. God, I choose to follow you every day for the rest of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Come and work in my life. Amen. Amen. Hey, well, thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video today. Like, subscribe and share if you think this content will be helpful for you or others. If you did give your life to Jesus today, please let us know. We would love to walk that journey with you. You can check us out at brightchurch.com and we look forward to seeing you either in person at a service or online. We hope to see you soon.